Hi guys, Olive here, here today to talk to you about what I read in April of 2018. It was a pretty decent reading month overall, and I got a nice little boost at the end of the month by participating in Dewey's 24-hour readathon. Total, I read eight books. Let's get started talking about them. The first book that I read in April that I would like to talk to you about is The Woman Who Would Be King, Hatshepsut's Rise to Power in Ancient Egypt by Kara Cooney. This is a biography of ancient Egypt's longest reigning female pharaoh written by Egyptologist Kara Cooney. Hatshepsut was the daughter of the pharaoh and the great general Tutmosa I, trained from a very early age in leadership and strategy since she, as the daughter of the pharaoh, was expected to marry the next pharaoh, one of her brothers. Upon marrying her brother, she would become wife of the pharaoh, but also mother to the next pharaoh, which is the most prestigious title that any woman could have in ancient Egypt. But when she did marry her brother, she only bore one daughter and no sons. And therefore, when her husband died, the throne went to her nephew, her husband brother's son. When this happened, Hatshepsut began to serve as regent for her young nephew, since he was too young at the time to be able to lead effectively, since she herself was a wealth of knowledge in how to lead a country properly. This was not an unusual setup to have a female regent for a pharaoh, since a lot of pharaohs came to the throne at a very young age. But what was unusual was that Hatshepsut first unofficially and then very officially declared herself co-king. This was not the first time that ancient Egypt had had a female ruler, but in all previous instances it had been done out of necessity when there was no man to do the job. This was not true in Hatshepsut's case. So, very slowly, as to not ruffle any more feathers than she needed to, but very determinedly, she began to assert power in a very non-violent, non-greedy way. Kara Cooney paints Hatshepsut not as the power-hungry woman that other historians have loved to portray her as, but simply as the right person for the job. She was smart, well-trained in war, she knew how to negotiate, she knew how to keep the right people on her side, but most importantly, she knew how to shape her image in the eyes of her people. She just knew the game of how to lead, and Egypt was very, very successful under her reign. Her story lacks the upheaval that colors the stories of other female rulers, and since salacious tales are always told first, her name is much less well-known than, say, Cleopatra. But hers is a success story, and while it is not incredibly dramatic, it is remarkable. Kara Cooney does a great job at explaining just what is known about Hatshepsut's story, and also conjecturing at what may have happened in those places where we don't know the full story. She sometimes gives fully formed, educated guesses about what may have occurred at a specific period in time, and other times presents a few different ideas about what may have occurred, since we can never fully know the truth. I also really loved her discussion about the way we perceive and talk about female leaders even now. This book is certainly worth a read, especially if you're interested in ancient Egypt. The next book that I finished in April was Sourdough by Robin Sloan. This is the latest release from the author of Mr. Penumbra's 24-hour bookstore, and in it we follow female programmer Lois living a lonely, workaholic existence in the Bay Area. Being as busy at work as she is, she starts to become a regular orderer of takeout from a non-defined ethnic restaurant that is operated out of an apartment. They have really fantastic food, but what is the most special about their food is the sourdough bread they serve with it. Lois becomes downright addicted to the food that they're serving, including the bread, and she starts to become friendly with the two owners. Then all of a sudden, due to visa issues, the owners of this restaurant are forced to close up shop and leave town. But before they go, they give Lois their sourdough starter, which is a slodge of wild yeast and bacteria that is used as the base of sourdough bread. Before they go, they teach Lois how to keep the sourdough starter alive. And before you know it, with the help of the internets, Lois is baking out of this world's good sourdough bread. This new baking hobby gives Lois a sense of purpose in her life. And the starter that they gave her proves to be an object of fascination since it is far from ordinary. The starter seems to have its own personality, and in true-to-form Robin Sloan fashion, there is a hint of the supernatural in that fact. I thought this was a really fun book. I found it even lighter than Mr. Penumbra's 24-hour bookstore, if that's even possible. But there were some kind of oddly placed and only once mentioned attempts at philosophizing that I thought this book could have done much better without. I find that Robin Sloan's books are a lot like marshmallows. They're sweet, they're fluffy, they're fun to consume, but there's not much to them. But you knew that going in. But if you're looking for a fun spring read that is light and easy to blow through, 
I think you should try this. The next book that I finished in April was Valette by Charlotte Bronte. This was my pick off of my 2018 classics TBR that I was really eager to get to considering Jane Eyre is one of my favorite classics, but I hadn't read anything else by Charlotte Bronte. This is the story of Lucy Snow. We first meet her in her older childhood during an extended visit to her godmother's house. Upon the conclusion of this visit, we fast forward many years in Lucy's life to when she is an adult after some unnamed tragedy has happened in her life that leaves her homeless and in need of work. Looking for a means by which she can support herself, Lucy travels to France and settles down in a small town called Valette's, where she at first is given a position as a nanny for the children of a headmistress of a local boarding school, but then she is promoted to an English language teacher at this same boarding school. Throughout the novel, we see Lucy dealing with often defiant students, with this omnipresent headmistress who seems to see and hear everything, and also with two different love interests. I think it's inevitable, if you've previously read Jane Eyre, to find yourself comparing this book to it. Jane Eyre is Charlotte Bronte's most famous, most beloved work, and so it's really hard when you're reading Valette not to hold it up against it. Before I read this book, I had heard some people say that it is even more accomplished than Jane Eyre. I am still mulling over whether or not I agree with that. But what I do know is that this is definitely a Charlotte Bronte novel. My girl loves her some weather imagery, ghosts, and brooding older men. What I found really different from Jane Eyre was the tone of this book. It is much less hopeful, but much more realistic. And in that way, I found it a lot more grown up, but not pessimistically so. I found Lucy to be just as strong as Jane, but where I've always seen Jane as this resolute character, but also very resigned to whatever happens to her, I found Lucy more of a spitfire, more willing to tell you like it is. I've always seen Jane Eyre as a character who kind of carries her sadness with her through life, and that definitely affects her attitude. Whereas it seems like Lucy had much more of a happy upbringing, but experienced tragedy later in her life. So I found her attitude to be more of it is what it is. What I loved equally about both of these books, however, was the way that Charlotte Bronte writes characters. They are fully formed, completely memorable, cannot be confused with anyone else. This book has really stuck in my brain. I've continued to think about these characters and what they would be doing after the events of this novel in the same way that I did in Jane Eyre. But as I was reading this book, I was really wishing that I spoke some French, considering there is a lot of French in this book, and I continued to have to go back and consult the end notes to see what they were actually saying, which tore me out of the story a little bit every time I had to do it. I am a footnotes kind of girl all the way. So did I love this book as much as I love Jane Eyre? No, but I thought it was really fantastic. The next book that I read in April was The Man Who Spoke Snakeish by Andrew Skivirak, translated by Christopher Mosley. This was my random pick off of my TBR for the month of April. This is a massively popular book in its native country of Estonia, so much so that they based a board game off of it. This book draws heavily from Estonian folklore and reads very much like a grown-up dark fairy tale. We first meet our main character, Leomet, when he is a child living in the forest with his sister and his mother. This book takes takes place in an alternate magical version of medieval Estonia where the people of the forest can learn to speak what is called snakeish. This allows them to not only have a kinship with the snakes of the forest, but also to control the behavior of most of the animals in the forest. But the number of people living in the forest is dwindling as more and more people are being lured away from the forest to the neighboring village by all the technological advances that they have there. In the village, people join organized religion. They start wearing cloth instead of leather, start eating bread instead of meats. They completely forget how to speak snakeish and they see the forest dwellers as sinful heathens. The old ways of the forest are constantly being pitted against the new ways of the village, and you can probably see that this ends up being a pretty heavy-handed satire of the erasure of tradition. I did really enjoy this book, even though fairy tales aren't really my thing. It still managed to hold my interest. I think it's a really interesting world that he created within this book. But I do have to say that it definitely dragged at times when he was belaboring some of the points that he was trying to make. And it is very violent, often gratuitously so. The next book that I finished in April, I ended up speeding through during Dewey's 24-hour readathon, and that was The Female Persuasion by Meg Wallitzer. This was supposed to be a buddy read with Jennifer, insert literary pun here, that we ended up reading at different times because I couldn't put the book down. This story, like a good number of Meg Wallitzer's stories, has a cast of characters, but in my opinion, there are three major ones. 
Greer Kadetsky, her boyfriend Corey Pinto, and her mentor, who is also a feminist icon, Faith Frank. When we first meet them, Greer and Corey are the smartest kids in their high school. At first they are academic rivals, but eventually they fall in love and enter a relationship. They are both pursuing admission to Ivy League universities, but while they both get in, only Corey is able to attend due to an error that Greer's parents make on her admissions paperwork. Instead, Greer accepts a very generous offer from her safety school, but she and Corey are forced into a long distance relationship. At her new college, Greer becomes involved in politics and activism, largely inspired by a new friend she makes named Z, who on one occasion drags her to an event on campus where a feminist icon, Faith Frank, would be speaking. Completely by chance, Greer gets the opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with Faith after this event has concluded, and Greer leaves a strong enough impression to impress Faith and inspires Faith to give her her business card. Years later, after Greer has graduated from college, we see her working for Faith's Women's Foundation, determined to make a difference. But when great tragedy unexpectedly comes into Corey's life, Greer and Corey are driven apart and the mentor relationship that Faith and Greer have hits all-time highs, but also all-time lows. I thought this book was fantastic. It was so compulsively readable. It got its claws in me, and I just could not stop reading, even though this was supposed to be a buddy read. Sorry again about that, Jen. I am in awe of how simple Meg Wallitzer makes it look to write a big, broad-in-scope novel like this. As in most of her novels, we see a huge expanse of time in these characters' lives, but she's so concise. She knows exactly how much to show you. And then throughout the story, she sprinkles in these little observations on life that I have felt so alone in my experience of because I've never heard anyone else verbalize them before. Her work is so touching, yet it's so readable, and she writes group dynamics better than I've seen anyone else do it. Anytime there's a group of characters on the page, you can feel their electricity, like it's downright crackling. I have been so reticent in the past to ever have a list of favorite authors, but Meg Wallitzer has forced me into creating that list, and she's at the top of it. The next book I'll be talking about was my pick off of my young professional TBR, and that was The Joy of Tax by Richard Murphy. This is one I'm only going to touch briefly upon, since I know not everyone is going to find this topic as interesting as I do. I even had a couple of Goodreads friends see that I was reading this book and comment on the title like, um, but this is a very short, surprisingly readable overview on taxation. What tax is, what its different forms are, the role that it plays in the economy, how taxes should be used by governments, and the different ways that we can change the tax system to make it more effective and fair. In this book, Richard Murphy takes down the traditional definition of taxation, specifically the use of the word compulsory, which I thought was a really interesting argument. He talks about how deceptively simple the concept of a flat tax structure is. He talks about how government and banks create money, and because of the way they do so, why having a balanced budget is never going to be possible. He has some very stern words for Margaret Thatcher and argues for more education on taxes. I found most of this book to be very straightforward, but then again, I work in finance and have a lot of education on money and banking, so I can only really see it through my eyes, but I think this would be accessible to anyone who wants to learn more about taxation. And the last two books that I read in April are books that I have discussed elsewhere, so I will only briefly talk about them in this video. The the first of those is The Curse of the Boyfriend Sweater by Alana Oaken. This is a deeply personal essay collection that on the surface discusses crafting, but actually discusses life, love, family, and grief. I found this book to be so heartfelt and touching. It is the second nonfiction book to ever bring me to tears. I did a full review on this book, and I will link that down below if you are interested in watching it. And on the opposite side of the enjoyment spectrum, I also read Three Dark Crowns by Kendare Blake. This is the first book in a YA fantasy series about warring triplet queens. It is unfocused, it is boring, and it is ultimately representative of some big problems that I have with YA series. I discussed this book and those problems that I have in a very ranty discussion video that I will also link down below if you want to see me get very angry. So those are all the books that I read in April. I would love to hear from you in the comment section below if you've read any of these books, if you've heard of them, if you now want to read them after hearing me talk about them, or if you'd like to chat with me somewhere other than YouTube. I am on a variety of different places on social media. The links to all of my profiles are linked in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.